So hello everybody, my name is René Mostert um, and I work at Orange Cyber Defense. Um, and this talk is how I found a, a local privilege escalation vulnerability um, on an enterprise laptop. So the idea was that I was on an assessment, I'm a penetration tester, and I was provided um, an enterprise laptop uh, as long with a, a normal everyday account that didn't really have any real access. Um, and I needed to, to obtain local administrative access, um, effectively um, into your authority system, so I can do things like disable the EDR and, and go and use that laptop then to, to hack forth into the organization. So if you've done this type of stuff before, you'll know that it's often quite hard. Um, I looked for the telltale normal things that people look for. Things like uh, unquoted service paths and you know missing Windows patches and all that, but didn't really find much there. Um, so then I started looking at the enterprise software. Okay, cool. So um, what I found out was there was this thing called Spokes Update Service.exe, and it was running as NT Authority System. Um, so that's great. Um, I thought maybe I could go ahead and hack this thing. It's part of Plantronics Hub. So Plantronics is a company um, that make headsets. These are the enterprise headsets. You'll find them in like call centers and stuff like that. Um, and they're, they're fairly well known. Now Plantronics Desktop Hub, which is the software that we're seeing on the screen here, it's used to manage those headsets. Um, and I, I try to think maybe I can you know, get system access from it. So I, I Googled Spokes Update Service to see you know, what's what. Um, and it shows the results were that it's been hacked about twice before, at least. So let's go back in time. The first time it was hacked was by Marcus Kell. And he, he really figured out how um, this application works, specifically the update portion of it. So there's two components that you need to be aware of. There is spokesupdateservice.exe, and then there's ptlhub.exe. All right, so ptlhub.exe, that's what you're seeing on your screen there. This is the, the application that runs as an you know, everyday normal user, and every now and then it will go out on the internet and try to find an update. If it finds an update, what it's going to do is it's going to go ahead and download the um, update. This can be either an MSI or an EXE uh, into some type of temporary directory. Now remember, this is a, a low-privileged user running this application, so it can't really execute that update itself. Um, so what it does instead is it writes this magical file called majorupgrade.config to that um, directory there. Anybody can write that file, any user. Um, the idea here is that, in effect, within that file, you're going to get a one-liner. It's a kind of a proprietary format. It's a one-liner, and it contains the path of that downloaded exe or MSI. Okay, and Spokes Update Service constantly tries to open this file, constantly tries to read this file, and then goes ahead and um, effectively sees if that file exists. And if it does, it will try and get that path out of it and then execute the uh, MSI or EXE as into your authority system. So it's really easy to, to exploit this. All you do is you write your own major upgrade.config and you go ahead from there. Um, you write a path in there to a malicious binary of your choice and um, spokes update service will effectively just go ahead, uh, open up major upgrade.config, and read that path, execute it as NT authority system, and you have um, system access. So it was really uh, easy to exploit this one at the beginning. Um, so Marcus Kell uh, reported this to, to Poly, which is also known as Plantronics, which is also known as HP, and they acknowledged the bug and released a patch. So now we are at the second time it's been exploited. This is uh, rate to me uh, security, and they also wanted to obtain an NT authority system from the same service. But now there's a bit of a snag. It does signature verification. So um, that means that if the MSI or EXE that major upgrade.config points to isn't signed by Plantronics, um, spokes update service just won't launch it. And they realized this is a time of check, time of use vulnerability. Okay, so a time of check, time of use vulnerability, for those that don't know, is effectively um, in the context of files, um, you have an application and that application is going to go and do some type of security check on a file. And then later, 
after that security check has passed, it's going to go ahead and use that security file. So in this case, the check is where we check the signature validation, and the using is where we go ahead and then execute that MSI or EXE. Now, the, the bit where there's a vulnerability in is generally there's a time differential between when the check occurs and when the use occurs. A bit of time between the two, and an attacker can do something, typically modify that um, file, so that it, it wouldn't have um, really passed a security check. It's done directly after the validation uh, or the, the check, um, but before the use, so that it ends up using the malicious file or the modified file. In this case, what they, they realized is that they can go ahead, provide a valid MSI that's signed by Plantronics, and you can go and download that from the, their website, there's a bunch of them, um, let it pass the, secure, um, the signature verification, and then quickly swap it out before it gets executed. So that's the idea. There you're going to see if they can swap it out with an evil MSI just before um, it gets executed. Now, the timing of this is really difficult. You need to know when that signature verification is done, and in that few milliseconds before it gets executed, you need to swap those files. So this is quite hard to do. Um, and that's why they call it uh, typically a race condition. Okay, cool. So uh, that's a bit of a problem, but they have read the work of James Forshaw, um, who by far is the, the MVP of my talk and, and pretty much everybody's talks that, that really works on these type of things these days. He had this, this great sem seminal talk, uh, A Link to the Past, uh, using symbolic links on Windows, and I highly recommend you guys um, go watch that. And he did a bunch of cool things in that talk, but one of the things he talked about is how you can use opportunistic, opportunistic locks or op locks um, to win these um, time of check, time of use vulnerabilities. Okay, cool. So um, what is an op-lock? It's this feature of Windows where any old process running as a normal user, not an admin, can go ahead and lock a file. So you can say, hey, I want to put an op-lock on a file. And that will cause any other process um, that wants to access that file to effectively pause until you release that op-lock. So this does two things. It allows us to pause um, an incoming um, you know, request to a file, giving us some time, some leeway to you know, do things, evil things like modify the file, swap out an MSI and so forth. Um, but the second thing it does is it gives us a very good indication of timing when we need to do things. Because it's always a guess about when you want to exploit you know, the, the time of check, time of use. So um, this is really uh, quite useful, this idea of an opportunistic lock. Okay, so read to me guys. Um, they realize that they can use this to effectively obtain system access. So what they do is they set an opportunistic lock on MSI EXE. This is the actual EXE that goes ahead and launches MSIs. They then write a major upgrade of config pointing towards a valid um, MSI signed by Plantronics, right? And then they wait. They wait for that opportunistic lock to be triggered when Spokes Update Service basically is completed the signature verification and tries to start um, MSI XE. As soon as you know that opportunistic lock um, triggers, you know their exploit gets a ping, a callback, um, and spokes out that services effectively paused. And in that time, they can now do the switch, where they switch it out with an evil MSI. Um, uh, now you're past the check, right? So now effectively the signature verification is already done and is now getting to the use part. You swap it out quickly, um, and then you release the op lock. It allows us to pause effectively before, um, swap out, and then release, and then spokes update service will continue and actually execute the evil MSI. So that's the idea here. We do a bit of a swap room. Um, okay, so this is, is great news, and they obtain um, NT authority system. Okay, so now it is my turn. I too want to obtain um, system <laughs> and be cool like all these guys. Um, I had a, a bit of um, you know, doubts that I would be able to get it right because this is the third time that this thing has been, been hacked. Um, but I started investigating it with um, good old Procmon and Gitra. And I reverse engineered it uh, quite a lot. And um, there's a, a few things that have changed. Um, you know, you have to make sure that it's now the same product. You can't just go download a random MSI that's signed by Plantronics. It now has to be the same um, Plantronics desktop hub, what you actually have to provide an MSI or EXE for. 
and the, the validation check makes sure that it's still, you know, it has to come from Plantronics, it has to be a newer version as well, there's other checks and balances. But by far the most interesting thing is how they stopped that previous vulnerability where we swapped out the MSI. And effectively what they did is they went ahead and first recorded the permissions, the file permissions of the installation file and its directory. So they have this record of what's going on, um, what permissions are set on the installation file and its directory. They then go ahead and set new permissions. Um, so the new permissions mean that only system can access that file and the directory. And then they start the um, signature verification process. So they go, go through the signature verification process, but at this point, you know, we can't swap out the MSI anymore because we can't change um, those files because only system can access them. All right, so that prevents that, that way. After the, the, the verification failed and after, you know, um, the, either the verification will fail or the installation will complete, but in any case, afterwards, they will go ahead and restore the permissions. So you first record, then we set some, some new permissions that only system can access it, we do the validation, and then afterwards we restore the permissions to what we were on the installation file and the directory. Okay, um, so I, I hope you can, can kind of see what's going on here. Um, I'm going to just, presentation is a bit difficult to read, but um, in the beginning, you can see just the process of how this goes. There at the top, we have the first box, um, we have where Spokes Update Servers reads um, major um, upgrade.config. Um, so that's where we, we've now written um, you know, a major upgrade.config containing a path to uh, installation file. Then we have in the green box, the second one here, where we can see query security file. So we're querying what permissions are set on Plantronics Hub installer. And then later, you can see we do a set security file. That's where we set the new permissions. So we first record, and then we set the new permissions so that only system can access it. All right, um, then just very quickly, we do the same thing um, for the actual directory that um, that installation file is in. So you can see install files also gives a query, and then later a set. Then in the, the box at the bottom, you'll see that there's just a bunch of read files. This is where we are doing the signature verification. We're reading through that um, installation file. Um, and this continues over here um, until the signature verification is done. It fails at this point, and now it's restoring it. You can see once again, we have got two set security files on the installer as well as um, the, the, the directory it contains. Okay, so very quickly. Um, I had this idea, you know, I'm probably not gonna win a way of fudging the, the signature checks, but I might be able to exploit these, this kind of logic that they have where they first go ahead and, you know, record permissions and then later set it. Specifically, what I wanted to do is I wanted to record lax permissions on one file very permissive permissions that will write, allow me to override that file. And then I want to swap it out so that it restores it on a different file. And this will allow me to go ahead and change the permissions of any file on the file system to what I want. Um, this can allow you to obtain into your authority system effectively by um, going ahead and uh, you know, changing a, a binaries uh, permissions um, so that um, you can override that binary. You pick a binary that you know is going to be executed at some point as system. You go override that and you wait until it's uh, executed. So that's basically how this would work. But effectively, how do we do this? How do we you know, get it to first record permissions and then later um, restore it on a different file? So once again, we're going to go back to um, the best guy ever, uh, James Forshaw. In his talk, he also talked about symbolic links. Okay, so if you don't know what a symbolic link is, it's basically a special type of file and it allows you to um, basically access other files or directories. So you can have a symbolic link and it points to another file or another directory. It's basically a way to provide you with the ability to access a file using a different file path. So it's a different name, but it can also be in a different directory. Um, James Forshaw talked about in his talk how there's a couple of different ways that you can make symbolic links in Windows. Um, so the, the straightforward way is the, the native um, NTFS symbolic links, but you need to be Win, um, an administrator 
to actually do that. So it's not very useful. Uh, there's registered key symbolic links, but that's not useful either for us in this particular context. Um, and then there's directory junctions. Directory junctions are great. Um, anybody can create them. A low-level user can create them effectively, but they're only between two directories. You can make a symbolic link between two directories, but not between files. Okay, so they're useful, but they're not really symbolic links in the way that um, we would like um, there to be. And then there's object manager symbolic link, which allows you to create um, symbolic links between object directories. So what, what on earth is the object manager? Within Windows, you have um, this object manager. It basically keeps track of a bunch of resources, you know, things that are important to Windows, like files and sephomores. It's this low-level hierarchy construct. It's not part of the file system, but um, it can include a bunch of different resources. And the hierarchy is split up in different um, kind of like directories. So uh, that's kind of useful. Um, you can see there's a couple different ones like RPC control and so forth. Um, so that's more or less the, the idea here. That is what the object manager is. And the symbolic link, um, an object manager symbolic link is just a link between these different internal um, kind of object directories. So James Forshaw in his genius figures out that you can do a couple of cool things about this. Firstly, you can go ahead and create a directory junction on your file system towards an object directory in the Windows Object uh, Manager. So this allows you to access on your file system um, actually the, the object um, directories. It's a very weird concept, but allows file system access. And the second thing that you can do as an unprivileged user, you can go ahead and create these symbolic links, these object manager symbolic links um, to object directories. And this allows you to go ahead and you know, create them in places like uh, RPC control. And the third bit of the puzzle here is that you can create object manager symbolic links to point to files. So they combine all this together and you get this idea that you can go ahead as an unprivileged user and create what we call James Forshaw style symbolic links. So the long and short of this, if it's a bit too technical, is this is a way that you can go ahead and create as an unprivileged user a symbolic link in Windows. All right, um, James wasn't done yet. Um, he also did this thing called bait and switch, which is the first uh, thing that we're going to try. Um, effectively, what uh, James did is he thought to himself and he realized that he could probably combine his opportunistic locks uh, along with the symbolic links to win these kind of like time of uh, check, time of use uh, vulnerabilities, especially when it relates to a file. So the idea is that typically what you're going to get with these vulnerabilities is a process that opens a file twice. First to check it, and then secondly to um, actually use it. So the first time, okay, so we're going to give a, a James Forshaw style symbolic link to this application, right? But the first time we want that symbolic link to point towards what we call the bait file. The bait file is a valid file. It's going to pass a security check. And then we set also an op lock on the bait file. That means that we're going to get a ping back in our process when the, the, the actual um, application that we're going to um, exploit or try to exploit has accessed that bait file. This gives us that signal information, that timing information to know now is the time to switch symlinks. So we destroy our current symlink. Um, delete it, recreate it with the same name, but effectively at that point, now pointing towards the, the malicious file, file number two, also called the switch. So this is what the bait and switch is. We first provide a valid file, um, we set an op lock, we wait for you know, that op lock to ping, and then we do the switch to get it to cause it to go to a malicious file. So the first time the application opens up a file is going to be successful, everything is going to be good. Um, it's going to pass a security check and then we quickly swap it out. All right, so that is the, the bait and switch. Now we're going to get to our first attack. With all this in mind, we're going to go ahead and use bait and switch to um, try and exploit um, Spoke's update service. Our use is a bit different. We don't need to pass a check here. The first time that this file kind of the application opens up our symbolic link, what's going to happen is it's going to go and record permissions. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to provide in our first symbolic link, um, basically make it point towards an installation directory that has very permissive permissions. And directly after that, we're going to wait for that op lock to trigger, 
we're going to swap it over um, and we're going to make sure that um, it restores the permissions then on a target file. All right, so that's more or less the idea. Once again, what we're doing here is we're trying to, trying to override the permissions of a, another file. Um, so I'm going to skip this in the interest of time and just go ahead and show you the demo if, if everything works correctly. Okay, um, apologies for the resolution. Can you guys see that? Okay, um, I just need to go to the beginning. Okay, here we go. Okay, so we're gonna start off. This is Plantronics Hub um, installer. This is our installation file. And you can see very um, lax permissions. Everybody can override this file. Um, pretty much anybody in the world. We have an empty directory. This is where our symbolic link is gonna go. Um, you need an empty directory to use James Forshaw style symbolic links. Um, and now we're gonna open up major upgrade.config and you'll see there is our effective um, symbolic link. So we are, we're pointing towards um, empty dir and then sim.exe and that's where our symbolic link is gonna be. Okay, we have the bait and switch application that you just can download from the internet. And we have our target, WordPad, which um, we're going to go look at the permissions now. And you'll see, effectively, that uh, it's really locked down. The only guys that can actually write to it is um, Trusted Installer. OK, uh, now we're going to go have a look at Procmon. This is just going to record stuff for us, what happens, because it's a bit difficult to understand. Um, so you can see there, I turn it on and constantly Spokes Update Service is trying to read major upgrade.config, just constantly trying to read that. I'm going to clear that. Now we're going to try and run this exploit. All right, so it's time. Uh, we type in bait and switch, we press enter. Um, so there's a, a different few um, things here. The first is just the name of our sim link. We've already given you that. That's sim.exe in that empty directory. Target one is going to be our installation file, that's where we're getting our permissions. Target two is going to be the, the actual place that we want to override it, where it's going to be restored on. That's going to be wordpad.exe. And then we've got our share modes. And we're just going to use an exclusive lock, which means that any access will, will trigger the op lock. Um, so I'm going to go, I guess, ahead and make some typing mistakes. And oh no. OK, I guess I didn't. Um, there you go. That's basically the, the same syntax that you get the idea. Um, so symbolic link, um, exe, and then Plantronic Hub installer, and then WordPad, and an X for exclusive lock. I'm going to press enter, and the first thing you're going to see is just how um, I believe the repass point, also known as the sim link, is going to be set. Okay, now we're going to that directory, the, the magical directory where we're going to go copy uh, major upgrade config, and that's going to start um, the spoke other service off. And as soon as we do that, you'll see there we've got a ping back from an op lock saying, hey, um, something tried to open up um, you know, our bait file, and now it's switched. So it switched from the one to the other one, and now it's pointing towards wordpad.exe. So this is very quick, and it's not really a good way of explaining what's going on. So let's going to look at um, just proc one. Uh, initially, you'll see there it's trying to read um, and then successfully reads major upgrade dot config. That's where we spoke update service starts. Okay, the next up is going to try and access our symbolic link. The symbolic link gets parsed, and now the symbolic link is the, the full path uh, Plantronics up, hub update installer. And that's the, the second one there. Now you can see that um, the actual op block triggered. Um, and in bait and switch, we go ahead and close our op lock, allowing you know, the security permissions of that file to be read. So that's the next one, query security permissions. Um, but because the op lock is triggered, we now switch over the sim link. So we've, we've switched over the sim link at point, now it points to WordPad. So it tries to do the validation on Word, um, like, um, basically it's recorded the permissions there of Plantronic um, Hub Installer and it's gonna try and you know, validate WordPad, but that's just gonna fail. So here it's opening up the, the second time, um, and you can see that now 
resolves to wordpad.exe. So when we get to set um, security file a bit later, you'll see that it now is going to go and set the security permissions on wordpad.exe instead of restoring them on the original Frontonix Hub installer. Okay, um, we're gonna go ahead and then just look at wordpad.exe's um, permissions. And you'll see now, after all of this, that uh, we now have the ability, and everybody has the ability, to override that file. Everybody has now right access to that file. All right, you guys make me feel bad for clapping now because you don't, you don't know what's going to happen next. <laughs> yeah, in the real world, uh, Defender uh, blocks this. So uh, yeah, uh, there's not a, a lot of good reasons to make James, um, you know, for sure star symbolic links. There's, there's no real other use case for it except exploiting your privileges. Um, so um, EDRs and Defender and everybody else is going to basically block this, um, which is a problem. Um, and this is now kind of the crux of the, the talk, is the new kind of technique that I've developed. Hopefully um, this will be useful as well. It's not a, a super fancy technique, but I did find that it was useful for at least bypassing EDRs. So instead of James um, Forshaw style symbolic links, what we're going to do is we're going to make use of directory junctions. So we're going to have a chain. We're going to have two directory junctions. Now remember what a directory junction is. It's just a symlink to a directory. It's only two directories, and any user can make them. The nice thing about directory junctions, it's native Windows functionality. It's never going to be you know, picked up by EDR as weird and malicious. We're going to chain two junctions together. So it's going to be a junction to a junction to a directory. OK, so we've got our entry junction and then our exit junction. And we're going to go ahead and switch out the exit junction. So um, during the signature validation process, we're going to go ahead and, you know, first um, the exit junction is going to point to the beta directory with our normal installation file where we get the permissions from. And then during the signature verification, we're going to go ahead and swap it out so it points to the directory of our target file. So this is just another way sort of, of, of switching out everything, um, but that's more or less the, the idea here. Um, okay, so there... You can basically think of it as like a tunnel that just changes its end. Um, it's quite useful. Why do we, we need um, two of these? Like, why do we have an entry and an exit junction? If you remember correctly, the directory also gets locked down. So if we provide our symlink um, or our path of a symlink with our entry junction, um, effectively what's going to happen is um, Plantronics, uh, the spokes update service, will set system permissions on the entry junction. So we won't be able to delete that one. Um, but the exit junction is going to remain unaffected. So that's why we have two of them. The first um, you know, junction is really just there to soak up um, those permission changes. OK. Um, the problem that typically runs in with um, you know, doing this approach is that directory junctions are only two directories. You don't have that file information, the file name information. So how do we control that? Well, we just go ahead and rename our installation file. Remember, we provide our installation file um, at, in a major upgrade.config. So we can rename it to be something like, for instance, wordpad.exe. In the beginning, when our um, exit junction points towards you know, our bait directory, um, it's going to, you know, be able to access it because we've renamed our installation file to target. And when we do the switch as well, um, later on when the directory points towards that target file, um, we, it's still going to work out well. So this is just a way to basically control um, you know, that file information. Now this is all cool and well, and we've been talking for a while, but so far we've only changed permissions of files. Um, so how do we actually get system? Like I mentioned before, if you can override the permissions of um, any old file on a system, you can just do it to a particular um, application that you know will be executed as a system. And Windows are full of them. Um, so you override the permissions of uh, an application that will later be called a system, and then you go ahead and um, you know, override it with a malicious binary. However, 
Um, I didn't really want to do this because it may cause some you know, instability in the system. I was reverse engineering um, spokes update service when I realized there's a condition that will get spokes update service to go ahead and call PLT hub as system. So that's more or less the, the idea here, and that's what we're going to try and do. Um, we are going to create this magical file called scheduledupdates.json. Um, and once we do that, it will cause spokes update service to go ahead and launch a PLT hub as exe, uh, as um, NT authority system. Um, the idea here then is that we're going to first override uh, PLT hub.exe with a malicious binary. So this is more or less how just that, that format look. It was quite hard to figure that format out. Um, but this is now our full attack. We're first going to go ahead, change the permissions of PLT hub.exe um, with our directly chaining attack. Then we're going to override PLT hub.exe with a malicious binary of our choice. And then we're going to invoke it um, basically as system by writing scheduled updates.json to start it off. Okay, um, and now it's time for the second demo. Okay, so here we go. Um, uh, we once again have a Plantronix hub installed. We have Plantronix Hub installed, and um, we're going to look at the permissions. Now, remember, this is ptlhub.exe. This is our target. When we go look at it, you'll see the permissions once again. Um, it is very locked down. Uh, users can't write to it. So we want to be able to change it so that we can override it. So here we're going to go ahead now and uh, look at our installation file. Once again, very lax permissions on our installation file. Um, everybody can override it. That's where our information comes from. And now we have our exploit, which I wrote, and then we have a payload. Now the payload here is a very simple payload. Um, it's just going to create a new admin. Um, so now I'm going to show you just that there's nothing under the hood. Um, I'm going to run net user to show you that there's new, no um, admins called a new admin. So you can see there's just uh, administrator and user there. And that's basically what's going to happen at the end of this um, presentation, is we're going to see a new user pop up. Okay, so this is our exploit. It's going to take a couple of things in. Firstly, the um, path to our installation directory. Um, so you can see there. And then secondly, the path to our payload. And then the small sleep duration, which I just found useful to make sure that everything is um, it's good. But it's not really recommended. I think we, we sleep for like 500 milliseconds. Um, so it's not that, that hard. Okay, so we ran it. And now we're going to do a couple of things just explaining what happened. We first created a directory called symlink1, and then symlink2, and then a bait directory. Then we made a junction from symlink1 to symlink2, and then from symlink2 towards bait. So this is our directory chain here. So they all kind of all point now to each other in a nice chain. Um, and then we copy over the installation file. We're going to give it a new name. Now we're going to recall it now to ptlhub.exe, to the bait directory. Um, so now I'm going to just visually show you once again just how all this looks. Um, first, I'm going to go ahead and show it to you in um, CMD. Just make sure everybody gets it. There we have um, symlink1, and symlink1 is pointing to you know, symlink2. So the directory junction1, is our entry junction is pointing to symlink2, and then symlink2, which is our exit junction, is pointing towards the beta directory. That's where our you know, valid file is. And if we go now to symlink1, you can physically see ptlhub.exe there. That is our installation file. It's also in the bay directory, and it's also in symlink2. So we're all just forming a chain at the moment. OK, um, next up, we created an opportunistic lock. So we're going to go and look at that now. So that whenever somebody tries to change the permissions of symlink1, which we know our process will do, it's going to give us a ping back. And that will be our trigger to know we need to switch over um, effectively to the, uh, the exit junction so that it now points towards the target directory. We then go ahead and invoke all of this by writing our major upgrade.config, and we are using symlink1, PTL hub, that is the kind of like destination. Um, and there we see, you know, we got our ping back. It says, hey, the op lock is triggered, and we're just waiting for me to press enter here and to start the actual chain.
All right, this is what's, once again just a, a, a Procmon view of, of what actually is happening. You can see there we create our um, directory junctions, symlink one and symlink two. And then you can see there um, we're just copying over, the exploit is just copying over Plantronics Hub Installer, now calling it PTL Hub inside the beta directory. That's just a copy, it takes a while. Then we go ahead and write um, major upgrade config, and you can see then directly after that. Um, spokes update service starts, and it reads major upgrade config, and it's going to try and query the security permissions of our bait file, and then it's going to set you know permissions on the bait file, so it's now restricted. So we've recorded it, we've restricted it, and now it's trying to restrict the directory, and by the way, that's when our uplock triggers. Okay, directly after that, uh, we're now gonna press enter, that's gonna release the uplock, and the rest of the exploit's gonna go ahead. Okay, cool. Um, so, very quickly, it says it's waiting for that installation validation process to start now, because we've released the uplock, and then we've swapped out the directory chain. In the middle of this validation process, you'll see we're just swapping out it so that it points to a, another place. So here is the validation process just really starting off. You can see that we've released the uplock and now um, it's just starting the, the validation process. That's all the read files there. And in the middle of all of this is our exploit changing that um, symbolic link. You can see there we delete a repass point, which is our directory junction, and then we recreate it. So we're deleting that exit junction, recreating it, so it now points towards our um, target directory. And that means when later it tries to restore the permissions, it's not going to restore it on the installation file. It's actually going to go ahead and restore it on ptlhub.exe, which we'll see in a second. So it just finishes the signature verification, that fails, and now it restores it. There you can see the query and then the set. Um, and now it's setting on ptlhub.exe, which means we successfully kind of overwritten, you know, um, those permissions. Yeah, um, here we go, and you can see, yay everything is now writable. So now our user can kind of overwrite it. Now we're gonna go back and um, overwrite ptlhub.exe with um, a malicious binary of our choice. Um, this is our payload, which is gonna go and create a new user. And there we say, we just press enter. Um, so what's gonna happen here, we're gonna do two things. We're gonna overwrite ptlhub.exe with a malicious binary that's gonna create a new user and directly afterwards, we're going to write scheduled updates um, JSON, which is going to start PTL Hub um, as system. Okay, um, so it's done it, and now we're just waiting for scheduled updates to effectively um, be read. So this is going to take a few seconds, but you can see there we've written, um, basically overwrite um, read payload we override it there to ptlhub.exe, and there we go ahead and write scheduled updates. So now we're just waiting a few seconds for scheduled updates to go ahead and trigger. Um, sometimes it takes two minutes, but in this, this case it will take a few seconds. Yeah, there you go. So it is um, effectively read by Spokes Update Service. And there you can see the creation of a new process for PTL Hub as NT authority system, meaning that our payload has now been executed. Um, so now we're gonna go ahead and just look to see if there is a new user. And we type in net user as before. And you'll see there's now a new admin. And if we type in net local group administrators, you'll see that it is part of the administrators group. Yay, um, so I disclosed this to um, Plantronics and HP 
that was a slightly painful process. Um, but uh, the long and short is it that they have released a patch and they acknowledged it, they released a patch. Um, they haven't made it public yet. Um, we've given them sort of um, indication that we will be talking about it today. And they released a, a temporary CVE for it. But um, <laughs> they are going to uh, publicly you know, disclose it with us. It is agreed upon, so we're not just dropping zero days here. Um, but it's, most importantly, it is patched. Okay, uh, so takeaways, um, last slide. Effectively, symbolic links are great. Um, if you really want to get into all this stuff, go and watch the talks of James Forshaw and a, a bunch of other talks that came up after him that talks about how you can kind of exploit this. The problem these days that we have, however, is James Forshaw's style symbolic links are getting picked up by EDRs and defenders and stuff like that. And in some cases, you might be able to use my directory chain technique um, to bypass this. It depends on effectively how it works, um, your particular application you want to exploit, but chaining two directories together, or just using directory junctions, might be your solution, and it's unlikely that's ever going to you know, trigger an, an EDR or anything like that, because it is um, just native Windows functionality. Okay, cool. Um, opportunistic locks are great for making sure that you get some timing information, as well as allowing you to pause an incoming application um, so that you can do some malicious activities. And that's more or less the, the main takeaways here. Um, one last thing is that you can keep in mind that um, you know, file permission changes actually affect the junctions and not the, the directory that the junction points towards. And it took me a while to realize, but the, the actual um, junctions themselves can soak up permission changes for you. And that's more or less it. Uh, thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.